elder accountability is a huge aspect of what it means to have an effective biblical eldership. And one area in the realm of accountability that tends to cast its shadow over everything else is the area of sexual temptation and how to deal with it. It seems like almost every day we hear of stories of uh, fallen pastor elders and moral failings. And it, it should go without saying that we don't want to bring a reproach on the name of Christ. Uh, one of the qualifications for an elder is that he's to be self-controlled and self-controlled in the area of his sexual appetite. He's to be a one-woman kind of man. We'd all agree with that, but we also need to not be naive. Uh, we need a proper biblical understanding and theology of, of sin and human fallenness. Uh, we are fallen people and we are prone to wander, as the hymn says. So what are some practical things that elders can do uh, as a team to protect against uh, the onslaught from Satan, from the world, and, and even from our own sin, our own flesh, uh, that all wreaks havoc on the name of Christ and his church and uh, his under shepherds. So in the words of John Owen, I love, I love this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So what are some practical things that elders can do? Well, first of all, we'd say acknowledge it and pray about it. Acknowledge it and pray about it. Every single week we meet as elders and we, we spend two hours going through uh, different agenda items. And the first half hour of, of that meeting is prayer. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for our sick people. We pray for our young people. We pray for uh, leadership development. We pray for local missions. We pray for global missions. And then we pray for one another in the area of sexual temptation. It's actually listed on our prayer sheet each week because uh, we know it, it doesn't take much for us to make a complete mess out of our lives and bring a reproach on the name of Christ. It was the famous preacher, British preacher, uh, Alan Redpath, who said, there is no sin that I'm not capable of committing five minutes after this sermon is over. We need to not be naive and we need to guard against uh, the, the attacks of Satan and the world and our own flesh. It doesn't take much for us to make a mockery out of everything we've believed and, and taught. So we need to have a high view of uh, the nature and power of sin and not be naive. And we need to take heed lest we fall. An elder is to have self-control in this area and he's to be a one woman kind of man. And, and this includes, of course, every area of his life, including his thought life, including any kind of pornography, which is readily accessible and available online. Uh, but elders need to not be naive about this. Elders shouldn't have their heads in the sand when it comes to this. They need to uh, practically do something about this. And, and the first thing we think is to acknowledge it and pray about it. Uh, proactively pray about it, acknowledge the tension and struggle for personal holiness. Now, the second thing we would say is to have regular meetings of accountability and openness. Now, there'd be a few extremes we would want to guard against and avoid. One extreme is a kind of life control uh, where this kind of accountability looks more like a police officer than, than a brother. But the other extreme would be no accountability at all. Uh, and this is a kind of darkness that leaves room for sin to flourish and grow. Uh, but regular meetings with other brothers is a means of bringing sin into the light. It's one tool among many tools of exposing the deeds of darkness. So elders need to have some level of openness with other brothers. Uh, this may be a fellow elder, it may be a former elder, it may be uh, someone else like a mentor, but it's critical that you as an elder have someone in your life who has permission to ask the hard questions, and you need to be honest with them. There needs to be someone in your life who has permission to speak into your life. And regular meetings are a means of doing that. I should also say it's a means of fostering humility. 
Uh, but we need to be careful that we fear God more than we fear being exposed. Uh, Eric Raymond, who's written a, about accountability or on accountability, has said, accountability is often quite helpful. He said, however, many times folks end up fearing their accountability partner while remaining numbly void of a healthy fear of God. This does not kill the root of sin, but unwittingly increases a fear of man. We need to kill sin and and we need to expose the deeds of darkness, and, and we need brothers to, to do that. As James says, confess your sins to one another and you'll be healed. So have enough humility uh, to go before another brother or mentor and, and pray about this and address this and have some measure of openness and confession and prayer. Another tool in the arsenal is software, actually. Uh, software, it can be a practical help in this. Programs like uh, Covenant Eyes uh, are a help in mitigating sexual sin online. Content blockers like uh, OpenDNS uh, also help mitigate the opportunity for uh, sexual sin. You know, Jesus said it well, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Of course, using a bit of hyperbole, but his point is very clear. Be radical with sin. Uh, Go to extreme lengths when it comes to dealing with sin and stopping habitual sin. This might mean for you uh, that you you really should not have a smartphone or a tablet, or or you really should not be online in in, uh, private places. Uh, That may sound extreme, but if it's too much of a temptation, think about it. What's more significant, your your soul uh, or your freedoms in this area? So, so think about this, talk about this, but, but harness the good technology we have um, and, and use it to help you, use it as a tool. Another tool uh, is to regularly rehearse the consequences of sin. Uh, Randy Alcorn has written a lot about this and, and he said this in his book, I believe it's called Sexual Temptation, a short little book, very good. He said, I met with a man who had been a leader in a Christian organization until he committed immorality. I asked him what could have been done to prevent this. And he paused only for a moment and then said with haunting pain and precision, if only I had really known, really thought through and weighed what it would cost me and my family and my Lord, I honestly believe I wouldn't have done it. And Alcorn goes on to say he, he repeatedly, in his own life, when he's traveling or feels vulnerable, he'll, he'll repeat a list that he created uh, on consequences of sin. He has a list of uh, uh, two or three dozen. And let me just read a few of them from Alcorn. One consequence, grieving my Lord, displeasing the one whose opinion most matters. Uh, dragging into the mud Christ's sacred reputation, uh, forcing God to discipline me in various ways, uh, untold hurt to Nancy, my best friend and loyal wife, loss of her respect, a uh, hurt and loss in, of credibility to my beloved daughters, uh, shame to my family, shame to my church family, embarrassment to my fellow pastors and elders and list their names. Uh, Guilt, awfully hard to shake, even though God would forgive, would I forgive myself? Plaguing memories of flashbacks, uh, possible diseases, uh, possible pregnancy with its personal and financial implications, and and on and on, you get the point. But if we were to really think through the actual consequences of our sin, I think that's a great tool for helping us to sin less. Another point we'd want to make is confession. Uh, Not all sin is disqualifying sin. The entertaining thought of adultery and the act of adultery are two different things, even though they're both wicked and sinful. But the elder needs to be quick to confess and quick to repent. He needs to be open with those who are holding him accountable. He needs to walk in the light and not live in the darkness with his sin. The Lord is serious about the holiness of his church, and he's serious about the holiness of his under-shepherds. They're to be above reproach. They're to be self-controlled in this area. They're to be a one-woman kind of man. 
The fact of the matter is that no elder is worthy of the work. Uh, If the Lord were to mark our sins and our iniquities, who could stand? But nonetheless, elders are called to be above reproach in this area, and this includes the the sexual life, and, and you need to confess your sins. It's a battle that will never put a stake in the ground and claim victory. Uh, We won't reach sinless perfection in this life, but it's a battle we must acknowledge and we must fight. And confession is part of that fight. I want to mention a few resources that are helpful, I think, for pastoral elders, at least to to have in their arsenal, if not for themselves, for other people in, in their church. And one book that's excellent that recently came out is by Heath Lambert called Finally Free. It's the best resource I've actually ever read on the topic of accountability and and sexual temptation. And again, I think every elder should have this, if not for himself, just to be aware of. And in that book, Lambert offers a great explanation of what accountability is and is not. I just actually want to read uh, his points. There are six, seven of them. And uh, just mention them as we're thinking about and learning about accountability. Number one, effective accountability does not rely exclusively on accountability. It is actually one weapon among many. Second of all, effective accountability is involved early rather than late. It's preemptive. It's calling out for help in the moment of temptation and before you sin. It's not delayed confession or regular reporting of sins committed. Third, Effective accountability involves someone with maturity. Uh, Fourth, effective accountability involves someone with authority. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Uh, Those who can speak into your life with some measure of authority. Number five, effective accountability should avoid explicit details for your sake and the sake of the person you're meeting with. Number six, effective accountability places the responsibility for confession on the person with the problem. And seventh, effective accountability must actually hold people accountable. It means you're involved in their life and vice versa. There's a measure of care and calling and concern and meals together and some measure of fellowship. So those are some practical things from Heath Lambert that I think are helpful for us to keep in mind as we're we're talking about and thinking about this broader area of effective elder accountability.